because it goats and even sheep too require a little bit more intensive fencing, even for paddocks within there. Um, so we use that most of the time. I do subdivide my pastures in half with like a semi-permanent fence. So I just have step in posts with two strands of, of poly wire. And, um, and, and, and the other piece I would say is training. And so training is key. Um, you can't just expect that they're going to learn it on the fly. Um, and I think this is probably true of all species, but especially goats. Now that I have sheep, I like, I think I'm still like more partial to goats, but I can see how people sometimes can get frustrated with goats if they add them on later. So I think maybe I'm more tolerant or appreciative of their personalities and zeal for life. But um, the, the training I think is really important. I am so excited to be joined by Leslie today. Leslie, please take it away. Tell us about your farm. Tell us about your enterprises and what got you excited about goat grazing. Sure. So my name is Leslie Sachina and I own Cylon Rolling Acres. We're a grass-based goat farm in Western Wisconsin. And um, I say goats, but it's mostly meat goats, but we do have a small flock of sheep as well. So I have to, we've been a year into grazing sheep. So I need to sometimes remember at least to acknowledge them. Um, <laughs> they're they're still well cared for they're just my our focus has always been on goats and so that's kind of where my brain sits but um we have you know the farm itself um we are our herd we have about a herd of about 70 to 80 head right now um, of breeding stock of boar kiko cross goats and we raise them for meat um everybody always asks us about everything else except um meat um which is okay i mean depending on your background it you um People may not be as familiar with raising goats for meat, but they're um, a pretty multi, like multi-utility um, species. And um, depending on your background, um, you know, if you're, I mean, to put it very like generally speaking, if you're not like a white Anglo background, um, it's very possible that goat is probably either um, more familiar, you know, maybe you don't eat it a lot, but it's, you know, maybe grandma had, or you, you know, for special occasions would cook it, or you might have it occasionally, or you've, you are familiar with it. Um, and so we've been, um, over this journey of raising meat goats, it's been this mix of, um, getting a good system down for raising them in the practices that we do with rotational grazing and regenerative farming practices. But then also on this, the other side of things, um, because we are a working farm also, really working on um, continuing to, to define and create a market for our, our goat meat um, and, and that side of things. But from a farm standpoint, you know, we talk about how many animals we have. Um, you know, of course, they have um, we kid every year. So they ha tend to have twins, sometimes triplets, once in a while quads. I prefer twins <laughs> um, just because it's more functional. So like our herd size, like our actual herd size can really fluctuate um, over the years, depending on where we're at seasonality and where we're at marketing goats as well, too. So but we're um, raising them um, with with grazing practices. And so that's been really like as we got started farming about 10 years ago, we are um I say we, my husband's involved with the farm, but I, I'm, but I'm, it's a, my entity, but because we're a family operation, um, he still is, assists a lot. So it's kind of we, me um, type of, um, thing, but um, with, with the goats itself, as we got into um, raising them, we knew as we looked at options that grazing was really how we wanted to raise our animals from like a, there's like a, a couple like elements. So one, um, as being a newer farmer and we um, had to purchase our land, we knew um, we need to be pretty creative in how we do things, but then also really keep a low bottom line. And that's not, that doesn't mean that we like a low input system. So it doesn't mean we're not caring, providing for animals, but we really have to be kind of like good stewards of our financial manage, of our financials as a small business owner and as a farmer. Um, and because we have, you know, we have to be accountable to making a, a payment on, on land and other things like that and making investments slowly over time as we build equity in the farm. So grazing really um, came into our mindset because it was a natural fit in how we could get started farming. Um, in our area, we have a, for a small farm um, that direct markets, we have a decent size acreage. 
um, just for scope or 140 acres, but you know, in the whole scope of agriculture in our area, we're pretty small. Um, and we have a lot, our acres is a mix of woods. We have some existing pat, well, pasture that was an old CRP with trees and things in it. It was a little harder to convert into cropland, um, just in generally speaking before we purchased it. Um, and then a little bit of hayland. And so, you know, when we got started, we had to really look at like, what could we be do and be creative with utilizing the size land we had with the scope of knowing like what, what's available in agriculture and what's available, like, um, and then market opportunity. And so that's how we came to raising goats was knowing that um, if anybody's in goats, you probably have heard there's, there's lots of market opportunity um, because if you go to the grocery store, it there, you can't find that meat, but as our populate, it's harder to find the meat um, unless you're in maybe a major metro area um, and have a pretty diverse population in that community that you might be in. So like we looked at, you know, there's market opportunity, but then also um, it's, you know, we could do more with our land with smaller ruminants. And so that's kind of where we got started. And so that how everything kind of merged together. And then the other piece with grazing is that um, it just made sense from a standpoint of working with the ecological system that's around our farm and um, working alongside um, mother nature. It sounds kind of, I don't know, idealistic, but it is, it's like, that's the mindset of like, it's not, it's not always easy. Of course, any farming isn't easy, but it's, it's um, the concept, you know, of, you know, if we were working with mother nature instead of fighting her, um, you know, I'm, it's, it's easier on us and it's easier on our animals over time. And so that's really, you know, that resonated with us as we started to get into learning about grazing and the practices and the benefits for the wildlife in our area, soil health, just being good stewards of the land. And so that's been really the foundation of how we got into grazing. Now, grazing itself, um, it's been, it's been, you know, kind of a, an adapt. I would say it's been a, it's been a long game to get to where we're at and we're still on this journey of raising our goats um, in this manner from um, continuing to build a resilient herd and also um, just the art of fencing and working with goats in that manner it's it's taken it's taken some time and also being being able to be creative in finding an approach that works well um, for us and knowing that there's not a lot of resources out there for goats in general um, there's very little research and academia um, textbook um, industry involvement but so it's like figuring out what works um, by learning by doing but then also adapting what I see what some of my um, kind of farmer friends are who are raising beef and sheep and so forth and and also knowing that just because um, maybe some of the so-called professionals say oh you can't have goats on pasture um, it's just because they don't like not many people are doing it thankfully there's a lot more people doing it now but it's um you know, they're just like anything with farming, there's not just one way to do it. And there's probably, um, there's just new science around with grazing and some of the benefits that way. So I guess that's kind of big dive dump I, um, into what we're doing. Do you um, let me know like where you, else you'd like me to take the conversation or other questions as well? I want to take us down that fencing road because that is the journey, right? And that's the number one. Uh, tell me definitely what you didn't work, like maybe kind of what the first thought is and why you've been mm -hmm. in that system and where you are now with fencing, because that's if what's the, if water can get through it, goats can go through it, right? Like, sure, yeah. <laughs> Dad, and every time I've talked about having goats, somebody's always like that story about how the goat got out and got on their dad's truck and then goats are gone. And I totally get it because was we, when we got started with, with grazing or raising goats, not even grazing. Um, I mean, grazing was part of the process from the start, but it was okay. So if we're going to have goats, we need, I know we need to have good fence. I don't want to have my goats get out. They do. I will admit they do sometimes get out, but um, I really wanted to minimize that because again, I want good fences, make good neighbors, no matter like how many or what kind of species you have. Um, and then I just wanted to make my life a little less stressful, um, you know, individually, but then also like on my family, my relationship with my husband, I mean, all of the above. Um, Middle so. of the day, your animals are <laughs> through the yard, out in the neighbors. Uh, they've eaten the azaleas from like the, mm -hmm. the sweet 80 year old woman down the road mm -hmm. and now she's mad. And now you have to make zucchini bread to apologize, right? Like <laughs> things like that. Um, so it's, you know, fencing I knew was going to be, um, be important and that's a you know my it was one of our first concerns and also um one that question I get all the time um or even like I think of friends or neighbors who have like beef cattle that want to add in goats and because they can be really great like um companion grazers 
um, whether they're with them in you know the same paddock or a leader follower type role. But it's like fencing can be a lot different because with cattle, you can get, you know, if you're permanent fence, it's like, you know, two, maybe two or three strand um, perimeter fence, or maybe one, you know, if you're just grazing and they're, they're good or you're subdividing, it's like one strand of poly and that doesn't apply with goats. Um, so we found um, when we got started, we were um, fortunate to be able to work with our local NRCS office to apply for equip funding, um, which is part of the conservation program. And the equip um, funding is a cost share program that helps um, farmers get started in implementing different conservation practices. So for us, our focus was on grazing. And so we were able to get, um, you know, we still had to pay quite a bit beyond this, but it really helped us invest in good perimeter fence um, for us. So that way we could have kind of that peace of mind. That was really important again for us to have a peace of mind of having that done. And we also decided, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do. I grew up, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I grew up in a family that was a do it yourself focus. My dad, he said he was a uh, home or a building contractor. And he always said we were, I was doing it myself before it was cool to say I was doing it myself um, <laughs> and repurposing and all that. So we've been, you know, we're, that's kind of our I think that's a commonality with anybody who's, you know, doing this type of work, whether it's for, for fun, um, a side project or, or for full time. And so there's a lot of things we do on our, on our own for the farm, but we decided having somebody else come in and put fence in was going to be a wise investment for us, partially time, but also I wanted to make sure it was done right. So our, our what perimeter... fence did you put in for perimeter? Exactly. Just <laughs> for yeah. Yeah. So, so our perimeter fence is, um, woven wire and then we have a hot strand uh, or a strand of high tensile on the top um, that's hot or electrified and then the bottom um, about six inches underneath our woven wire is um uh why am i blanking that um barbed wire the traditional okay. fence um means and so the barbed is really below we have guardian dogs that live full-time with our goats and so that's so they don't dig underneath though so they're not really I don't, there's probably some areas where they dig like, um, but usually it's not actually not in our, in our pastures, but then um, in the barn or winter time. Um, but then also for, pre, you know, from a predator standpoint, it prevents or deters probably is a better bet. Um, what height from, did you go for on your fence? And then our fence is about 48 inches tall. Okay. Um, and so the, the electric on top is nice. Well, it, it, it's good because you know, it prevents the goats from standing up on top of the, you know, standing on the fence. So they will sometimes put their, their hooves up on it, but because that, that electric's there, it's just an, a little reminder. It doesn't hurt them. I mean, it is startling, but like, it's a reminder that it's there and they should stay down. And then of course, other animals from coming in. And so, um, yeah, it's about 48 inches tall. Um, our woven wire is big enough that some of the goats can get their heads stuck through. So sometimes that is a little bit of our animals are horns. So sometimes it is a little bit of a pain in my side. Um, but I have to check my, you know, I check my goats a couple times a day. So if there are some that are stuck, I just help them get out. But usually it's like a teenager phase of when they're at a certain age and their horns are still small enough. Um, and usually if they have enough to eat, it's not a big deal. Um, but occasionally I have a few that um, it doesn't matter if there's enough to eat. The grass is always greener on the other side. So, but the, um, but the hot wire on the top is nice as well. Um, because then when we subdivide our paddocks, I just take our, our, um, portable fencing, which is a little bit more like just grab and go type style fencing. We can just clip onto that and then it electrifies our, our, um, our fencing in the, to subdivide for paddocks. And so for that, we're using, um, kind of a combination of options. So like in our existing fence, we have, um, we're using what's called Gallagher's Smart Fence. It's a four strand reel um, fencing system, kind of all in one. It's got fence posts in there. Um, if you take a look at like my um, social pages on you know, in, in YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, you'll see us using it. I really like it because it's easy to use. Um, and it's um, because it goats and even sheep too require a little bit more intensive fencing, even for paddocks within there. Um, so we use that most of the time. I do subdivide my pastures in half with like a semi-permanent fence where I just have step in posts with two strands of, of poly wire and they stay in there as long as there's enough to eat. Um, and, and, and the other piece I would say is training. And so training is key um, 
you can't just expect that they're going to learn it on the fly. Um, and I think this is probably true of all species, but especially goats. Now that I have sheep, I like, I think I'm still like more partial to goats, but I can see how people sometimes can get frustrated with goats if they add them on later. So I think maybe I'm more tolerant or appreciative of their personalities and zeal for life. But um, the, the training I think is really important um, because, um, and you can't always guarantee, like you don't want to assume they're going to learn from others too, or they're going to learn it because um, once one um, knows they can get out, the rest will follow and want to be by because the herd animals want to be by everybody else. And so and that's a hard lesson, right? Because as soon as one learns, and if you have a herd of 70, that's a, a yes. very slippery slope. <laughs> very problematic. And so we will train our goats um, every, every beginning of every grazing season. Uh, most of our experienced older does will remember. Um, and the kids do take the lead from their, their parents, but or their moms, but like, it's still good for them to understand and have a reminder of how the fence works because in the winter time, you know, they're around the, there, we still have our fence electrified, but we're not because we're in Wisconsin, we're not using um, the portable fencing just because it's harder to put in the ground and the way we're feeding there, we're feeding hay out on pasture. So it's like, we're not, they're not exposed to it like they are in the summer. Um, so it's when we do the training, um, essentially it's a few, you know, we make a small little section with the fence and probably put a, depending on where we do it, we might put a second, you know, um, a second, I don't know what to call it, like a second fence around that fence. And then usually it's like when they haven't been on grass before. So they're super excited to get fresh pasture. They let them out. I watch to make sure, especially that first day that, um, especially the young ones who are newer that, you know, as they eat, and they get closer, they're usually not always paying attention. Then they experience that, that, that little shock, which again, it's like, you know, they squeal. It's not, you know, it's, it, it will be startling, but they, once they recognize it, they'll respect it. Um, so it's kind of one of those processes you have to do. I mean, that's, it's designed to be a protector as well. So, um, I know sometimes people get a little nervous about electric fences, but, um, it, that's made a big, a big um, difference for us to do that training. So we'll do that. I'll have them go out for about a couple, like an hour. I'll watch, especially the first day. If some, if an animal gets out, I'll help them get back in, or if I need to turn it off quick and kind of get the fences fixed. Um, and that's like, we do use, I didn't mention it, but in our woods where we don't have perimeter fence, we do use the um, electro net fence just for extra sense of security. And that one as well, I think it's still important. Like it, you see, I think sometimes the tough part with that fence is like, it looks like it's going to like, there is a phys more physical barrier to it, but I think it's important to still train to that and make sure it's always on because um, like the one time I didn't have it on is when I actually had more issues of goats, like getting stuck in it. Um, and so like they can sense it, you know, when it's on and so forth. And so um, that's just a note of kind of side note related to that, but then for training, well, then I'll repeat that process the next day um, and kind of keep increasing the time. And usually within two to three days, I feel like they've got, and my herd has been experienced to it. So like, I feel like they kind of get to the right point, but that's helped tremendously with keeping our herd in check. Um, doesn't mean there won't be some that might get out. Um, but again, it's like making sure there's enough to eat. Um, you know, they'll let you know when they're ready to go. Of course, I always have to, you know, you should be assessing too and be ready. But um, if there are trouble, repeat constant troublemakers, it's, it's probably best to move them on to, um, another, another purpose in life, um, <laughs> or you decide that might be, um, and that just really has helped us have like a, minimize a lot of our issues with goats and our fencing. Um, you know, where I have issues is if I was, let's say we were really busy at home and with kids, like human kids and family and things like that. And, um, they had enough to eat, but it was probably, maybe I should have removed them the next, the day before, that's where sometimes I might run into issues where it's like more on me than it is on, you know, as a manager than, than on them. And so, you know, keeping the fence hot um, has been hot training, um, making sure it's grounding, right. Those are really like the really key pieces. Um, but you know, if somebody's looking to get started and up and quick process, um, the electronet fence, while it takes more time to set up is a good option because you don't have to put that other infrastructure in place right away but again similar concepts for that but if um, anyone's interested too I have a um, fence training guide on my website grazing with Leslie that is kind of does a rundown of um, things to take in mind um, when you're looking to fence train goats um, because 
that is very important <laughs> as is the fencing. <laughs> yes. And just for tangibility, <laughs> what, uh, what duels yeah. do you recommend running between, right? Like just to give a, a sense of people, what their netting should be hitting on. Oh, go ahead. Um, can you ask that one more time? Yeah. Just... What, what jewels do you recommend your fencing running at? Um, just kind of a framework. Yeah, I would say jewels should probably be somewhere to five to seven K, um, or kilowatts, sorry. Um, that's what you'd run your fence test or kilowatts. But I would say the jewels when you're looking at then um, what's on your energizer, probably at least four, probably higher. Um, just because when you're running um, fencing for go, whether it's net fence or multi strands, you're going to be, um, you're running a lot more wire um, than um, then one strand, which is typically, you know, what, that's why there's lower jewels, but then also you're going to get probably more brush and more grounding, um, out, um, effect just because you're going to be running fence down lower to make sure you don't have anybody crawling underneath. And then of course, um, just helping the animals remember that where they need to stay. <laughs> I, I'm going to take you down another tricky road. So talk to me about goats in the woods, because hmm. Mm -hmm. especially like really uncleared woods there's everything touching netting how do you get it in there uh, how do you manage that they're so beneficial in the woods and it's also such mm -hmm. a challenge to get them back there in a, a first phase of clearing <laughs> oh yeah so we're doing that in our woods now we're about I think it might be year three um one thing we've been kind of stages on that so it's we have a our woods is an oak savanna that used to be grazed a long time ago before it became less common to not have animals on the land. Now we're kind of re going back that direction, which is good because the, it was, we're in a prairie area. So it had a lot of big oak trees and prairie, 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 but since there wasn't a lot of animals and a lot of, um, you know, whether it's livestock or wildlife traffic, we have a lot of buckthorn that's grown up in there and other underbrush and so forth. And so it's a lot of undesirables. And so there's not even, aside from even just like feeding our livestock in a more traditional grazing manner, aside from goats love um, brush and have a preference to that, you know, there's not as much um, food source even for our wildlife. And so we've been, um, it's our goal to kind of, it's been a long, it'll be a long process to get there, but we've been working on gradually starting to um, do some renovation in our woods. And so part of it, we started with our woods had been logged a long time ago. It doesn't look like it, but it was. So we had some existing paths in there. And so we had been using those paths initially to, um, as we got started, to put up our, our fence. But um, this last year we took a more, um, I'd say we were trying to figure out ways that we could be more efficient knowing that the electric fence, the netted fence takes more time to put up. Um, and there's more um, obstacles in the woods, roots. And the like, rocks, the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every single thing in the woods doesn't put up. Yes, <laughs> um, it can be a morale. <laughs> <laughs> dropper when you're putting it up especially if you're trying to rush to get the next paddock set up but um it's yeah so you know we found that like so this year we we would mow our paths that were already existing and that was nice because it's like because they've been mowed for a while it's actually there were more grasses this year we spent more time trying to create um more uniform straights um I call it like woods paddocks but we um, mowed it where we could with our brush hog. And then, um, I know not everybody has this option, but we had, we don't have a skid steer. We sold that a while ago. We're kind of like small equipment, but we ended up purchasing a bulldozer from one of our neighboring farmers. Um, it ended up being a, a good investment because we're not taking down lots of stuff, but for like an easy way to clear, um, paths, um, we've been able, we use the bulldozer and cut or use the brush hog on our tractor to make those paths. And I think the idea is really like, you need to have, you need to do some brush removal to make it easy to put up your fence. And then, and that could also be like, if you're, if you don't have the equipment, find maybe somebody who, or somewhere you can rent one, rent something from, go in, get it, get your paths set up. So that way over time, then you, it's just, it just sets you up for success. Cause I'm really glad like this year we were able to start way in the back of our woods, which we've never grazed before. But now that we have these paths set up, it's a lot easier to set things up, um, be more efficient with how our fences get set up. If they're straight and only have a few corners, it's a lot easier than all these bends and curves and everything. Um, and so we'll continue to work on doing that. But I think, and I even think even in our pastures too, when our grass is really tall, 
um, I will either, sometimes if we have the brush hog, we'll mow, otherwise I will beat down a path with our gator because we, I usually use that as a, to haul around our fencing and other supplies. But yes, definitely clearing paths to get started has been beneficial. Um, I think like in general, um, the work the goats can do is, is, is pretty good, but like the, what they can cover like goats per acre is going to be a little bit, especially when you don't have as much undercut, like under, um, that's how grass under the, under the tree canopy, um, you're probably going to have a lot larger paddocks than what you might use if you were in more of a, a hybrid situation or a grassy, um, you know, pasture. Um, but you know, you kind of have to, it depends on it. Every situation is different, but I found that that is helpful. And I feel like the concept of quicker move, like for when we're grazing a regular pasture where there's more grass cover, um, quicker moves has been helpful for managing parasites because the parasite cycle, but when you're in the woods, if they're eating predominantly off the trees or they're eating up instead of down, um, you can also have a little bit more time in those places, um, generally speaking, which also helps then with like your time spent putting up the fence. So you could maybe size it a little bit bigger for let's say like a week, a week's time versus like one to two days, which would be, that'd be a lot with um, putting up a lot of that net fencing in, in the woods. So that, that was kind of what I was going to get after is like the psychology of moving the fences and how much time it takes. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously like the more movement in regenerative ag, the better, the more life, the more whatever, but also like if you're spending two hours moving netting and you think you're going to do that, like multiple times a week, multiple times a day, whatever, like that's going to eat up time and mm -hmm. affect the business as far as capital. Like how is that affected kind of how you factor into a business model? Cause time is such an important component. Oh yeah, exactly. And you know, I, I do like fencing cause it's kind of like, I am some degree an introvert. So it's nice to like think and have time to work on, you know, kind of either think about business stuff or other things in life or listen to podcasts or other um, audio books and things like that. But at this end, I just like being out in nature and all that. So like, I enjoy it, but at the same time, like there's other things that need to get be done besides moving fence. So like trying to be more efficient with my time and figuring out like timing that is beneficial, not, you know, for the ecological side of things, the livestock, but then also for us has been really important. And the other thing like this summer, like the first time we've had some summer help and um, also looking at like what's um, the fencing and like monitoring like paddock moves and knowing when to go or when to move is really important and still having eyes on my animals. But like, I also have to look at like from a business perspective, like what's the best use of my time. Fencing is very important, but if I am bringing on some help, like where is like the dollar, you know, like you think about like putting a dollar value on certain types of work responsibility as a small farmer, small business owner. I like, I wear all the hats, but, um, you know, working on marketing and new business ventures or offerings within our farm is going to help me move things down the road more than spending time fencing. I mean, the fencing still has to get done. So I look at it like, okay, so now we've been so that's where we focus like some of our help this last summer was helping on the fencing side of things um, just because then I could put my time into some of these more high value things. But um, that said, you know, that's not, everybody's got a different, every, you know, different model, but it's, you know, even within the woods, we've been thinking about, okay, so how can we do this a little, how can we continue to do this if we're not going to invest in perimeter fence or can we do bigger blocks and divide it with our net, with our, um, you know, with poly wire in the center, just to like have the framework set up, but then we can move them, you know, or where do we place our water again, like the, the, instead of working with these oddball sizes, what, what paths were already there, which worked to start with having more efficient ways to put up fence. I mean, all those things have helped us try to make ourselves more efficient um, because time is still, um, it's still money or it's still like, you know, lost opportunity elsewhere too. Yeah. And as a farmer, always important to value your time and pay yourself, right? Like, even if it is, you know, what you enjoy and like part of being in nature, it's still like, you know, you're a farmer and your time should be compensated for. I strongly feel it's important. So oh, yeah. Keeping well, and, this going. <laughs> and especially if you're, if you're um, direct marketing or using your goals for a service, like 
just because you do some, like we are, I think a lot of us who are get into this because we like, we really enjoy the work, but like the work and the, what you produce out of it is not any good. If you don't have a, I mean, what are you doing for if you don't have a place to serve, you know, a customer with? And so it, it, you need to make sure you're spending some focused time in that area as well too. If that's what, you know, if you're looking to be in that segment of agriculture, I mean, some folks will, you know, do with, if, if you do wholesale or um, sell to like a larger market base, it's a little bit different than with, um, you know, providing a direct service or product. So. Right. Well, take us down the, the direct to, to consumer road. That is a challenging, but rewarding kind of space. So tell me a little <laughs> bit about uh, goat was not the first meat that's in your grocery store. Like, you know, it, tell us about like, is it tough to market? How did you get into the niches? And how are you really working on developing out the relationships with people that in a way that really values like all that time and effort you're putting into the quality of the herd, the rotation, the land, like, tell me how you're building these relationships. Sure. So we, um, part of it was when we got started, um, I was, Thinking goes, I have a friend who teaches in a neighboring um, community and in her community, there's a really large um, Muslim population. And she had, had shared with me, you know, you should take a look at, at meat goats. And just because of availability or growing diversity w within our region, but just in general of our, of our, um, our, our country in general, and it's obviously much more than Muslim population. I mean, there's just about, as I talked about before, um, it's a pretty diverse kind of array of folk, of cultural backgrounds that do consume goat or goat is often, you know, an, a protein option. And so um, as I looked into it more, again, availability, that's just tough that's out there. And so it's, um there's a lot of opportunity with goat. The thing that makes it, a, but it's not like you have to work to make, like to create that, that marketplace and build a business. It's not like you will, you know, grow it and they will come. Um, I mean, there, there's some, though, up until probably recently, the, the regular like livestock market, at least in our region, it has been, has been really good, which is, is great in general. So like there are, can be some options. It hasn't always been really great. So for us, as we've been looking at, we knew we wanted to direct market just to be able to provide more value to us as a grower. But um, it's, there's a lot of opportunity, but it, it's not like a super easy win, but I think that's true of all areas of agriculture, um, no matter what you're doing. Um, but um, when I, you know, the market itself, um, when we started, we were kind of made gradual progression. So right now, just to get context, um, we are selling everything through our, almost everything through our website, direct to consumer. Um, it's most of what we are selling is, um, shipped um, across the country. Most of our focus is in the upper Midwest, Wisconsin, Minnesota, but we do um, have customers throughout the country. And then we have a little bit of a wholesale customer base like here um, in Western Wisconsin and the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. But as we've grown, most of my focus has been on the direct to consumer side of things, just because um, there's less risk. Um, I if it's probably no surprise now, after we've been coming out of the last two years, um, that while wholesale has been great for us to build our market, it's um, you you have a lot less risk when you have lots of customers instead of just maybe one or two. And so, I mean, we always knew that, but in wholesale has been great to get to us where we need to go. And it's been great to have good, like the whole partners we've had now and in the past have been great partners because they value um local foods, how we're raising our animals, um, our farming practices, um, because most of like what we're competing with, um, especially on the wholesale side is um, goat that's imported from Australia or New Zealand. Um, and so it's, there's nothing wrong <laughs> with those farmers, but personally, I would love to see, you know, more, more domestically raised, um, you know, proteins um, across the board. But um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of an interesting market. So we, you know, so when we started, we sold uh, the first few years sold to our livestock market because we were just growing our herd, getting the feel of like getting infrastructure set up. But I always knew I wanted to direct to market. So I started to create an online presence, a website for us, um, social media presence, just to start building relationships. And then slowly I was building our email list too, because that's our main form of, of sales.
And it's, you know, it's, it's easy to like kind of get going and you're like, well, I'll do some of this other stuff later. And like, it's definitely more intense now, but it's people like to watch the behind the scenes and see you grow and kind of are a champion for who you are. And so that's helped us along that way with continuing to build a community and a customer base. Um, so as we started to get more into marketing, we would work with our, and before we had on farm infrastructure for storing meat and licensing that way, we worked with a local, a couple local butcher shops to do them sell whole and have goats. Um, I learned pretty quickly once we started selling whole and halves that it only made sense to do half or a whole goat because um, goats are pretty small. And so if you compare it, um, you know, comparing to even lamb, obviously beef, like a whole goat, you're once the animal is cut and packaged, maybe 25 to 30 pounds of usable meat. Um, it depends on the size of the animal alive, but it's like, that's not, um, it's like a grocery shopping bag, you know, reusable shopping bag full. So it's, and what's your weight of the animal just for context, the bow or yeah. the goat, what's your average? Yeah, there? Yeah. So we are like, um, we will harvest at about seven, like 60 to 70 pounds. My goal is closer to 70. I actually, because we're direct marketing and everything, I would like to, I'm working on rate of gains to be closer to like 80, maybe 90 within, I would say like seven to, seven to 12 months of age, um, because it costs, it costs a lot to process a goat. And so if I can still have quality meat, but have a little bit more yield and ant, customers just expect larger cuts, even if they've eaten goat before, because, um, you know, they're thinking about like what lamb chops look like or what, you know, a steak from, a, you know, um, from a, you know, a steer might look like. So it's, um, some of it is like kind of that it's a little bit different, um, size and, um, time approach because we're direct and because we also are grass fed. And if you might look at like a local market, you might be in, um, so then when we had like, when we had a shift with one of our wholesale buyers, this was before the last couple of years. And so we had to take a look at, okay, so how are we going to sell more of our goat? It was a food, a food distribution hub that I think was a great concept, but the downside of it ended up being, we kind of lost the message of like, they were doing the best they could, but you know, with this small staff and small investment to get started, like my, most things, um, it, they had to close. But one thing I learned was like the power of like that relationship with customer or like the farmer and your customers and being able to tell that story and have those relationships. And it can come in a lot of different ways. I mean, there's probably a way to make it work with a model like that, but we found that like, we were kind of just another like commodity to put it broadly speaking. And so we decided, um, you know, let's take a chance on getting um, an inspected freezer, having package cuts at home on um, that we can sell from the farm and kind of dabble in some very basic e-commerce and I was surprised at how much that that opened the door um you know I think more people it doesn't even matter if you're eating goat or not are interested in they don't not everybody is in bulk buying mindset or if they want to try you know your meat whether it's something they a protein they've had before or not like goat um, it's a lot easier to do that when you can buy a few cuts of meat, like you go to the grocery store and um, have it as part of your, your menu option, or just, you know, buy it kind of on demand versus um, large purchases. And so that really started to open the doors. I figured we started with four that we got processed. I'm like, at the worst case scenario, we eat it ourselves and we can kind of go from there. Um, but we actually like in our state, um, it, our, our state, our inspected freezers for sales, um, it's, it's, it's a state license, but it's run through our county health department and we had to have a separate freezer for it, but we actually were able to, it was a dedicated freezer, but it was actually in a refrigerator with a freezer. So like very, like, I, I just say this because people think they need to have all this, like a walk-in cooler or like commercial freezers. Of course you need to check to see what your state, you know, what your state and your county require, but, um, I did a lot with just like a little side-by-side -side freezer, you know, when I got started. So it's, um, and from there we've grown where we've now, all we offer now is cuts of meat. Um, we do, and we do some um, variety boxes and then added a subscription program this last year where if people want to buy like a whole goat cut and packaged or a little bit better deal on, on, um, you know, 
on um, getting meat more regularly, um, they have that option too. One thing I would say, like also like as when it deals with meat goats, so we're we're very focused on you know this retail market. And when we started, even with our e-commerce, we were the first start. We started with just like an online form of just to like have people like you know fill stuff out. Now we're actually on a full like fully like people pay on pay before they get their product and so forth and. Um, but even with the, um, the piece of like, when we got started, we were doing a little, like, so the goat market, this is probably, this is similar. I think if, if folks raise sheep too, they may have heard this or seen this or may do it too. But like the other thing with goat is interesting is like, there's other ways besides what we're doing to sell. We just have chosen as we've gotten larger to go this route. But, um, when we got started aside from working with a butcher, we would also sell goats live for the purpose of eating. Um, also, you know, depending on state requirements, you know, for, for us in, in our area, we were, our customers would take the goat home and they would hurt, you know, do the harvest and cut and package, um, at home. And that's, it sounds to some people, it sounds kind of crazy, but like, that's just more of like a, a norm or not. It's more common with goats and sheep, um, to have that be an ask of customers. Um, I think it's a couple, it's like twofold. It's like one, um, a lot of our customers who, asset um either like maybe our second generation um living here um in our communities or um maybe you know again that's how grandma and grandpa got their go you know would purchase goats for their you know special family occasions the other thing is like again accessibility like where can you find goat meat um you go right to the farmer and um that that's the piece there are some states where you can do i mean i don't get into legal things, but there are some states that will allow you to do sell the animal and then your customer can harvest it there on the farm. We aren't doing that. And there's some states where that's not legal, but I just mentioned that though, because there are, there's different ways and things that you might not normally think about um, how, how you can market your goats. And there's other, um, I'd say small, like smaller herds in our area that their market is selling live animals to their customers and their customers take care of that processing and so forth that way. And so um, there are a lot of different layers, of course, that, you know, I'm, I'm spending more time on doing building relationships, with their customers, especially in the digital space, you know, for them, they're spending more time um, with their customers on goat selection and um, that process of, of, of purchasing lives. So, um, but for us, you know, as we continue to um, market our goats, we're really focusing on accessibility and making it easy to get goat um, without like the extra hassle. And we are really use um, the digital space. So like social or email um, list to build relationships and add value to our customers. We will sometimes have more salesy focus, um, you know, posts, but I really see it as like, we're you take your your customer, your community along on the journey of what you're doing, and they're going to be invested in you um, versus like feeling like you always need to be like peddling something, which is like a different mindset of sales and marketing. And that has worked really well. And I think people appreciate that because you're being, you're not, you know, it's it's a mix of like tran being transparent in how you raise your animal, but also people feel that, you know, they have, they really understand like more about who we are on our farm and what we're doing um, and it sets us apart from uh, other farmers and it doesn't mean like I'm saying that we're better than other farmers but like we each make our farms individual because of us and so that helps with that relationship you know that relationship building and helping us but like our main like sales focus is really focused on our on our email list so I'm always trying to get customers to move in that direction um, and that's where we do more of like our sales and continuing to add value with like helping our customers learn how to cook goat, different recipes, other kind of interesting information related to the protein, um, in addition to, you know, selling meat itself. One other area I'm looking, I'm working on, we haven't launched yet is integrating a, a texting service to, um, for those customers who want texting. I know not everybody wants that, but there are, there is a segment who is interested in, in that as well. So that's kind of like a, high level progression of where we've grown and some things that are opportunities that are available with, with GOAT as well. Do you feel there was one part of the digital marketing journey that was kind of quintessential? Was it the email list? Was it easier forms? Was it holes versus hats? 
Was there any point that you were like, this really kind of made it approachable for customers? Was there anything in there that was big for you? Yeah, I think um, making the move to an e-commerce piece on our website, I kind of, I wish I would have done it sooner. I think using it, like having a credit card, like you taking credit cards, I think can seem really intimidating. And then there's the concept of like the credit card is taking money out of my, out of my earnings. And so it's, um, you know, to kind of get in the mindset of that, it's like, it's a part of doing business or cost of doing business, but then you also need to like, just build it into your, your, your business structure. But once we had that available, and I think people are becoming more open to buying online now with the last few years, but like once we added e-commerce, it was like people, we were, it was easier for people to buy because they're used to buying, not everybody, but like a lot of people are used to buying on Amazon. We're not going to be Amazon, but if we can try to have a more seamless process to place an order, it can make a, a huge difference in getting those sales and also capturing them when pe- when customers want to buy. You know, when we were doing an online form, I mean, it helped, but like, then we were emailing back and forth on what was available and like times to pick up. And it was just like, you know, and then you lose customers because it's like, it's just kind of like, we make it too much work for our customers. And so I think when we were able to streamline it and make it easy for our customers, and it actually helps, makes it easy for me um, to that, um, you know, it, it really, it really helped us kind of move forward. And then I would also say like the secondary to that was developing an email list and continuing to work on growing that and serving our customers and being regular with that really is, has helped as well too. It's, um, it's work, but it's, it's been an important investment that way. I love it. You have been such a wealth of information on all the different subjects. Do you have any kind of last words of wisdom for anybody who would want to get started in the space or has Mm -hmm. goats, but hasn't turned them into enterprise? What's kind of your words of wisdom to those? Yeah, I think like getting started with goats, um, you know, you need to kind of get some of the infrastructure piece set up, but I think even starting small with getting a herd started you can kind of because goats we didn't even get into like the raising side of things but like it they are unique in their own in terms of their requirements you know they're they they can be a little more high maintenance so like getting the feel just of their personalities and how they work as a livestock species I think is sometimes the a big learning curve but then you know so you want to get the ball rolling but once you have them you need to kind of be thinking about okay what's you know pick pick some options on or some avenues of where you think you might want to start for selling them or just start with if you have a mark you know a livestock market opportunity maybe focus that direction and then start to gradually build um, some other opportunities within within that because I always thought you know being in a rural community it's not there's not um my opportunities were like an hour away in the big city well I found out pretty quick that there's a lot of who are interested or willing to even have go a little, you know, occasionally, um, right, you know, in our local community in Western Wisconsin, where we're still pretty rural. And so it's, um, you know, as you get going, you're going to be surprised at the opportunities that might come up, but it, it you've got to start somewhere to have, have something to offer too. I love that. Um, Leslie has so many other resources outside of even what we've talked about here. So I will drop her website, her social media. It is just constant helpful information. So everybody go check her out. And I know you also have places where people can connect with you, ask you direct questions. So we'll link all those. I appreciate it so much, Leslie. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the invite, Lauren.